the last talk we saw how dr boss ambedkar entered in the constituent assembly with the help of uh, his party members in bengal and how the indian constituent assembly was constituted by electing the members of the constituent assembly from the electorate college which was formed by the provincial legislative assemblies and we have seen that there were 296 members which were selected from those indirect elections into the constituent assembly and according to the cabinet mission plan the first meeting of the constituent assembly was to take place on 9th december 1946 and dr bawas ambedkar entered in the constituent assembly as a member in his own right but the majority of the members in the constituent assembly were from the congress party so one can say that the congress party dominated the constituent assembly because they had majority of the members and on 13 december Jawaharlal Nehru who was the first prime minister of India on when the interim government was formed before the formal independence of India the process already began the process of transfer of power it already began and he moved a resolution titled as aims and objects of the constituent assembly and those and that resolution had eight points and i'm not going to enter into those eight points because that's not our purpose but it's we are going to keep those that resolution at the back of our mind so that we can understand from which position dr bawas ambedkar was coming forth not only that but also bear in mind that muslim league boycotted the constituent assembly and they did not accord with the plan of cabinet mission of having one united constituent assembly because that time their the partition of india was not declared it was declared later next year so we are talking about the united constituent assembly wherein all the political party parties all the interest groups are supposed to represent themselves and when pandit nehru the resolution yamar jaykar after they had after the resolution was tabled yamar jaykar said and uh, declared in the constituent assembly that until such time as the muslim league choose to participate this resolution should be postponed because the muslim league didn't join so yamar jaykar proposed that this resolution should be postponed now imagine a situation of a constituent assembly nehru has placed in front of the constituent assembly the resolution yamar jaykar opposed to the resolution and there were about 20 30 people lined up to talk and debate on that resolution and dr bawas ambedkar was one of the speakers because he has given his name to make a speech but his name was not listed as the uh, because he was not a very senior member according to the constant according to the constant assembly and uh, but surprisingly rajendra prasad he ignored several senior members who were waiting for their turn to speak and invited dr ambedkar to speak on that occasion dr boss ambedkar was not prepared to give a speech on that day because he thought that his turn might not come that day even he he thought that his turn might come the next day or even it might not come but unexpectedly when rajendra prasad called upon boss ambedkar to address the house dr boss ambedkar took that opportunity to make a speech in the constituent assembly which is as we have seen made a very deep impact on the future politics of india and we are going to see the speech at length 
and we are also going to listen to what Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar said in the course of that speech. So he was given 10 minutes and he was asked to speak on that occasion. So I am going to read a brief, brief few paragraph and going to explain you the importance of the speech. Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar said, Mr. Chairman, I am indeed very grateful to you for having called me to speak on the resolution. I must, however, confess that your invitation has come to me as a surprise. I thought that as there were some 20 or 22 people ahead of me, my turn, if it did come at all, would come tomorrow. I would have preferred that as today I have come without any preparation whatsoever. We have seen in the past as to how Dr. Boss Ambedkar was preparing for his speeches. He used to take down the notes, think carefully about various ideas, think very carefully about how he is going to express those ideas so that people can understand them very clearly. But here Dr. Boss Ambedkar is saying that he is not prepared because he has come without any preparation. But when we go through the entire speech, we will see that a lot of preparation, a lot of thinking Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar must have put in in order to really come to the ideas that he elucidated or he illustrated in this particular speech. But he makes a very candid confession here. He says that he has come here without any preparation whatsoever. I would have liked to prepare myself as I had intended to make a full statement on an occasion of this sort. Besides, you have fixed a time limit of 10 minutes placed under these limitations, I do not know how I could do justice to the resolution before us. I shall, however, do my best to condense in as few words as possible what I think about the matter. Which means that Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar has a very clear thinking, though he said that he was not prepared, but he had, because he was a very keen student, he was in a political process of writing the constitution or the laws for India for a long period of time and he was very highly developed, equipped mind. So he was naturally in touch with all the situations, all the things, all the resolutions, all the that we will see in the speech. So we can say that uh, though he says that he is not prepared to make a speech, we can say that he has already been preparing for such an occasion to make a very grand statement on what he thinks about the future of India. He says further, Mr. Chairman, the resolution in the light of the discussion that has gone on since yesterday obviously divides itself into two parts, one part which is controversial and another part which is not controversial. It says that the resolution which Nehru has put in, in front of the Constituent Assembly has two parts, the controversial and non-controversial. The part which is non-controversial is the part which comprises paragraphs 5 and 7 of this resolution. So this paragraph 7, 5 and 7, I will read it briefly because it's just a half, half page note which was tabled in front of the Constituent Assembly. So the reserve paragraph 5 says, wherein shall be guaranteed and secured to all the people of India justice, social, economic and political, equality of status, of opportunity and before the law, freedom of thought, expression, belief, faith, worship, vocation, association and action subject to law and public morality and the seventh point was wherein shall be maintained the integrity of the territory of the republic and its sovereign rights on land, sea and air according to justice and the law of civilized nations. So this, this, these are two points of the resolution 5-7. So he says that these paragraphs they set out the objectives of the future constitution of this country. Dr. Vahas Ambedkar says that these two paragraphs, they set out the future objectives of the constitution. I must confess that coming as the resolution does from Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who is reputed to be a socialist, this resolution, although non-controversial, is to my mind very disappointing. He says that the resolution is very disappointing. I should have expected him to go much further than he has done in that part of the resolution. As a student of history, I should have preferred this part of the resolution not being embodied in it at all. He says there was no need to embody this sort of things in the resolution. He says, 
when one reads that part of the resolution it reminds one of the declaration of the rights of man which was pronounced by the french constant assembly i think i am right in suggesting that after the lapse of practically 450 years the declaration of the rights of man and the principles which are embodied in it have become part and parcel of our mental makeup i say they have become not only part and parcel of the mental makeup of modern man in every civilized part of the world but also in our own country which is so orthodox so archaic in its thought and its social structure that hardly anyone can be found to deny its validity to repeat it now as the resolution is to say the least pure pedantry these principles have become the salient immaculate premise of our outlook it is therefore unnecessary to proclaim them as forming a part of our creed so he says that this sort of uh, issues like justice and all they are already in the rhetoric political rhetoric of since the french revolution and he says that considerable time has passed when those when that declaration was made about the right of man when we look at the political history of france and america and the western democracies we can see very clearly that this sort of ideas and values are very clearly addressed so dr was ambedkar says that repeating the same thing is just an act of pedantry nehru should have go, gone into much depth when he put forward this resolution and what sort of depth nehru should have gone dr bawa sambedkar ambedkar elaborates further he says the resolution suffers from certain other lacuni i find that this part of the resolution although it enunciates certain right does not speak of remedies he says that this, the, the resolution speaks of the right but it doesn't speak of remedies all of us are aware of the fact that rights are nothing unless remedies are provided whereby people can seek to obtain redress when rights are invaded so he said that without remedies the rights are not valid it is just a moral statement so unless there is a remedy the rights are useless i find a complete absence of remedies even the usual formula that no man's life liberty and property shall be taken without due process of law finds no place in the resolution that's what he said and this is a very important thing that he had said this so i'm not going to go much into this part but i'm going to make a very important uh, comment which dr was ambedkar made in this particular light of the resolution he said that the resolution talks about justice social and economic justice in this country what about nationalization of land what about the nationalization of industry that is the question that dr bawa sambedkar raises in 1946 he says that talking about social justice and economic justice is fine but when we are talking about the economic justice what about the socialistic economy because only the social uh, uh, socialistic economy is going to lead to the economic justice that's what dr bawa sambedkar puts over here therefore personally although i have no objection to the enunciation of this proposition the resolution is to my mind somewhat disappointing i am however prepared to leave the subject where it is with the observation i have made so these are dr wasa ambedkar's observation about the resolution that nehru put forth and that is not the heart of the speech we are now just on the surface of the speech now we are going to enter the heart or the depth of the speech and this is very important because unless we understand this point we can understand the significance of this speech dr bawa ambedkar says the controversy is centered on the use of the word republic there is a word republic in the resolution it is centered on the sentence occurring in paragraph 4 the sovereignty is derived from the people thereby it arises from the point made by my friend dr jaykar yesterday that in the absence of the muslim league it would not be proper for this assembly to proceed to deal with this resolution 
Now, sir, I have got not the slightest doubt in my mind as to the future evolution and the ultimate shape of the social, political, and economic structure of this great country. He says, I have no doubt about the future of this country. I know that today we are divided politically, socially, and economically. We are a group of warring camps, and I may go even to the extent of confessing, confessing that I am probably one of the leaders of such a camp. But, sir, with all this, I am quite convinced that given time and circumstances, nothing in the world can stop this country from becoming one. And there is a huge uproar and applause when Dr. Vaas Ambedkar says that. The Constituent Assembly is shaken by this statement. With all our caste and creeds, I have not the slightest hesitation that we shall in some form be a united people. And there is a loud cheer in the Constituent Assembly. Then he says, I have no hesitation in saying that notwithstanding the agitation of the Muslim League for the partition of India, someday enough life light would be drawn upon the Muslims themselves and they too will begin to think that a united India is better even for them. And how he elaborates the concept of republic that we are going to see. So in the first few paragraphs he has talked about his general ad observations about the resolution. He said that the resolution is inadequate because it is just a moral statement. It doesn't provide, it doesn't talk about any remedies. Then he says that if we are wanting to talk about the social and economic justice, without remedy or without a method to bring it about, it's useless. It's just a moral statement. So he, Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar wants at that stage of history, of Indian politics, that there should be more than talk and more about the remedies, more about the methods, more about how actually social and economic justice can be given to the people. And then he comes to a very important point we talk about the republic. He says that if we are talking about the republic where the people will people-centered republic and the sovereignty is derived from the people, then we must go deeper. And he says that I have no doubt about the future of this particular country. So we are going to listen directly for six minutes the next paragraphs which Dr. Boss Ambedkar has spoken and I think that is going to be a very good to listen to it. So that is the direct speech. As the ultimate goal is concerned, I think none of us need have any apprehension. None of us need have any doubt. But my fear, which I must express clearly, is this. Our difficulty, as I said, is not about the ultimate future. Our difficulty is how to make the heterogeneous mess that we have today take a decision in common and march in a cooperative way on that road which is bound to lead us to unity. Our difficulty is not with regard to the ultimate. Our difficulty is with regard to the beginning. Mr. Chairman, therefore, I should have thought that in order to make a start in order to induce every party, every section in this country, it would be the act of greatest statesmanship for the majority party, even to make a concession to the prejudices of people who are not prepared to march together. And it is for this that I propose to make this appeal. Let us leave aside slogan. Let us leave aside words which frighten people. Let us even make concession to the prejudices of our opponents. Bring them in 
so that they may willingly join with us on marching upon that road which as I said if we walk long enough must necessarily lead us to unity. And if I refer from this place support Dr. Jacob's amendment it is because I want all of us to realize that whether we are right or wrong, whether the position that we take is consonance with our legal rights, whether that accords with the statement of May 16th or December 16th, leave all that aside. This is too big a question to be reduced to the position of mere legality. It is not a legal question. I say leave aside all these considerations and make some attempt whereby those who are not prepared to come will come. Let us make it possible for them to come. That is my opinion. In the course of the debate that took place, there were two questions which were raised which struck me so well that I took the trouble of taking them down on a note paper. The one question was, it was asked, I think, by my friend, the Prime Minister of Bihar, who spoke yesterday in this assembly. He said, how can this resolution prevent the League from coming into the Constituent Assembly? Today, my friend Dr. Shyam Prasad Mukherjee asked another question. Is this resolution inconsistent with the cabinet mission proposal? Ah, sir, I think they were very important questions. And they are, they I think ought to be answered. An answer categorically. I do maintain that this resolution, whether it is intended to bring about the result or not, whether it is the result of cold calculation or whether it is a mere matter of accident, is bound to have the result of keeping the Muslim League out. And I will substantiate what I said. Sir, I invite your attention to paragraph 3 in the resolution, which I think is very significant and very important. Paragraph 3 envisages the future constitution of India. I do not know what is the intention of the mover of the resolution. But I take it that it is a sort of, after this resolution is passed, it will act as a sort of a directive to the Constituent Assembly to frame the Constitution in terms of paragraph 3 of the resolution. What does paragraph 3 speak of? Paragraph 3 says, that in this country there shall be two different sets of policy. One at the bottom, the autonomous provinces or the state or such other areas as care to join the United India. These autonomous units will have full power. They will have also residuary power. At the top and over the provincial units, there will be a youth. This part is very significant to understand because, as I said, that this forms a very heart of the argument that Dr. Bosch Ambedkar is making here. 
So according to uh, the scheme which put forward, which was put forward by Nehru, the objective three, which I am going to read, is very significant and pay attention to the words. Where in the said territories, whether with their present boundaries or with such others, as may be determined by the Constituent Assembly and thereafter according to the law of the Constitution shall purchase and retain the status of autonomous units. Mark the word autonomous units. Together with residuary powers and exercise all powers and functions of government and administration, save and accept such powers and functions as are vested in or assigned to the Union. So, as are inherent or applied in the union or resulting therefrom. Here when Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar is talking about the republic and the resolution is talking about the residual power to be left with the autonomous unit. Now you must understand this concept of the residual power. So according to this scheme, the grouping of the states or the autonomous unit will be there and they will have autonomy. Then there will be the union, the central government which will not be very powerful and there will be some intermediate structure. This scheme Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar finds very, very detrimental to the future of the country. He says that this scheme is not about the scheme of the republic. And he says that in order to really arrive at some kind of a constitution, some kind, kind of consensus, the matter should not be entirely treated as a legal matter. So he says that treating it as a legal matter, he says that it's not a question of legal matter at all. He says that we should leave aside all legal considerations and make some attempts whereby those who are not prepared to come will come and let us make it possible for them to come. That is my appeal. So actually this is an appeal. So Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar is not just responding to the resolution, but he is taking an occasion, an opportunity to make appeal to not consider the matter just in the legal terms not at all in the legal terms, but he broadens the whole terms of the constitution. He says that if we accept the part 3 of the resolution, which will lead to keeping Muslim League out of the whole process. He says that the structure is going to be like this. What does paragraph 3 say? Paragraph 3 says that in this country there shall be two different sets of polity, one at the bottom, autonomous provinces or the states or such other areas as care to join a united India. These autonomous units will have full power. They will also have residuary power. At the top over the provincial units, there will be a union government having certain subject, subjects for legislation, for execution for administration. As I read this part of the resolution, I do not find any reference to the idea of grouping an intermediate structure between the union on one hand and the provinces on the other. Reading this paragraph in the light of the cabinet mission statement or reading it even in the light of the resolution passed by the Congress as its Varda session, I must confess that I am a great deal surprised at the absence of any reference to the idea of grouping of the provinces. So far, as I am personally concerned, Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar says, I do not like the idea of grouping. I like a strong united center. He says that I am not for this scheme. I want a strong united center because he realizes that India is not a homogeneous country. There are many interests. And if you let choose the autonomous units, their interest, if you let them have the residuary power, then it's going to create a big mess. Therefore, when the future constitution was drafted in India, the residual power came to the union, came to the
came to the center. Dr. Vasa Ambedkar says that he is for the strong center, much stronger than the center we had created under the Government of India Act of 1935. And then Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar enters into the question of how the strong center was created for 150 years. There was a strong center government which governed the entire country and which was responsible for a very efficient functioning of the administration. This is his position about the center, the strong center. He, he wants a very strong center. He doesn't want any residual power to the autonomous units. So, for example, if you look at the things from the present point of view, he is proposing that Maharashtra or Bihar should not have residual power and they don't have the residual power when the new constitution came in. The residual power lies with the central government, with the union government. But in America, such is not the case. The residual power is with the states. But then it's a very different country. We, we have a very different history. We have a history of people getting, thinking about uh, going away from the United India and that is what happened in few months. So he asks a question, why did not mover of this resolution make reference to the idea of a union of provinces or grouping of provinces on the term on which he and his party were prepared to accept it? Now here is a direct confrontation with the Congress party. He says, why they are diverging away from what is needed. And he says that here is paragraph 3 which the Muslim League is bound to take advantage of and justify its continued abstinence. Because the Muslim League was not in the constant assembly, they will say because the paragraph 3 says that we are the autonomous unit. So we will decide what we are going to do. It's none of your business. Ambedkar wants to reverse the position. And he says, he also criticizes a little bit uh, Dr. Jaikar. He says that he has treated the manner, matter in the legalistic way. He says, the basis of his argument was, have you the right to do so? Jaikar posed a question to the Constituent Assembly, whether it has a right to do so. And Dr. Bawas Ambedkar says, and he clarified that not, it is not a legal question. He says, that question, it may be that you have the right to do so. Dr. Bhavas Ambedkar says to the Constituent Assembly that it may be that you have the right to do so, you have the right maybe to pass such a resolution because the Congress party has a majority in the Constituent Assembly. He says, the question I am asking is this, is it prudent for you to do so? Is it wise for you to do so? Power is one thing, wisdom is quite a different thing. He says you might be having the power to pass the resolution, but he says power is one thing and wisdom is another thing. And I want this house to consider this matter from the point of view, namely whether it would be wise, whether it would be statesman-like, whether it would be prudent to do so at this stage. The question that I give is that, the answer that I give is that it would not be prudent, it would not be wise. I suggest that another attempt may be made to consider about a, a solution of the dispute between Congress and Muslim League. Then he says, this subject is so vital, so important that I am sure it can never be decided on the mere basis of dignity of one party or the dignity of another party. And what he says further is very important. He says, when deciding the destinies of nations, dignities of people, dignities of leaders, and dignities of parties ought to count for nothing. He says, the, de the destiny of the country ought to count for everything. He says, it's not the ego of the party which is important at this stage. What is important is the dignity of the country. It is not important the, the dignity of the parties, the dignities of the people is not important. He says, what is important at this stage is the dignity of this country. And it, the destiny of the country ought to count for everything. It is because I feel that it would be in the great, in, in the interest not only of this constant assembly so that it may function as one whole, but that it may have the reaction of the Muslim League before it proceeds to decide that I support Dr. Jaikar's amendment. We must also consider what is going to happen with regard to the future if we act precipitately. He says, 
I do not know the plan of Congress party because the Congress party is in, in the majority in the Constituent Assembly which holds this house in its possession. The Constituent Assembly is in the possession of Congress party. He says very boldly which holds this house in its possession I do not know what is in the mind of the Congress party. I have no power of divination to know what its leaders are thinking about. He says, I am not a divine person, so I don't know what's in the minds of the Congress party people. What are their tactics? What is their strategy? I do not know. But applying my mind as an outsider to the issue that has arisen, it seems to me there are only three ways by which the future will be decided. A very pragmatic thinker. He thinks very carefully. He put forth various solutions in front of the people, he analyzes the problem very critically and he sees the things very clearly. Because he can see the things very clearly, he can talk about the solution. He says, I do not know what is happening in the minds of the Congress party, what is their strategy, what is their tactics. But I know that there are only three ways by which the future will be decided. One, there shall have to be surrender by one party to the wishes of the other party. That is one thing that can happen, one way. The other way would be what I call a negotiated peace. He says that there can be a peace which can be negotiated. And the third way would be open war. So there are only three ways to determine the future. He says there is one party accept other party's domination. Or there can be a negotiated peace. And the third is the open war, he says. Sir, I have been hearing from certain members of the Constituent Assembly that they are prepared to go to war. I must confess that I am appalled at the idea that anybody in this country should think of solving the political problem of this country by the method of war. And he says that if Congress party wants to uh, launch or have a war with the British, it will not be the war against the British only but it is going to be also war with the Muslims. And he says that this is, going, this is going to be a very complicated war. And he thinks that that's not a good idea. Then he says, I cannot see how this contemplated war will be of the sort different from what I fear it will be. Sir, I'd like to read out to the house a passage from Burke. Burke's, Burke's great speech on conciliation with America, I believe this may have some effect upon the temper of this house. The British people, as you know, were trying to conquer the rebellious colonies of the United States and bring them under their subjection contrary to their wishes. In repelling this idea of conquering the colonies, this is what Burke said. First, sir, permit me to observe that the use of force alone is but temporary. It may subdue for a moment, but it does not remove the necessity of subduing again. And a nation is not governed which is perpetually to be conquered. If there is an ongoing war in the country, it cannot be governed. That's what we see in Pakistan, that's what we see in our neighboring countries. The statement is true even today. My next objection is its uncertainty. Terror is not always the effect of force and, and armament is not a victory. If you do not succeed, you are without resource by cons for conciliation failing. If you don't succeed in war, the possibilities of the conciliation are gone. Force remains, but force failing, no further hope for reconciliation is left. Power and authority are sometimes brought by kindness but they can never be begged as alms by an impoverished and defeated violence. A further objection to force is that you impair the object by your very endeavors to preserve it. The thing you fought for is not the thing which you recover, but depreciated, sunk, wasted and consumed in the contest. The thing you fought for is not the thing which you recover, but depreciated, sunk, wasted and consumed in the contest. So he says that the idea of the war is not good, it's a bad idea, it's not going to lead us anywhere. 
so he is not taking more time now he ends his speech let us prove by our conduct that if this assembly has arrogated to its sovereign powers it is prepared to exercise them with wisdom that is the only way by which we can carry with us all the sections of the country there is no other way that can lead us to unity let us have no doubt on that point so this is a very important speech where dr bas ambedkar has tried to position the future of this country as we have seen that people had very conflicting views about what is going to be the future of this country and there were many confused sort of views for example this object this resolution which was put forth by nehru had so many lacuni and dr bas ambedkar brought forth those kind of things but for him it was very important to have a republic in which the, there will be a strong center and there was no idea of strong center in this resolution though dr bas ambedkar said that he had not prepared for this speech but we can very clearly see the thinking that he had developed for this country how this country was to be united and what was going to make it united